Guys and gals and turtles and tortoises and reptiles, what's going on? Um, we are here for... This is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is episode number 20. I actually personally... I think a lot of podcasts make a big deal about what episode number it is, and while it's, it's a nice round number, that's cool, but it's also entirely up to us when we do them. It's not like we got, we're not like we made it to our 20th episode, we can do as, as many as we want. So maybe not that big of a deal, um, but I'm going to choose to, I'm going to choose to think it is. So thank you for joining us on, um, on our 20th episode. We have a lot to talk about. Um, we are going to say hello first, of course. How are we doing, guys? Hanging in there. Doing very well, thank you for asking. Mm. Pleasure to see you. Very compelling. Very compelling radio. I hope you've tuned in already. We're all <laughs> doing well. Um, so we want to just get, we want to, right off the top, we want to, everyone who is already tuned in, and we're going to say this a few more times throughout the broadcast, but... Um, the best way to we've been getting a little slower questions lately. We we want to have a little more interaction with you guys, uh, you the viewer, you know the little people. Um, so if you want to interact with us, the best way to do that is through the Google event uh, on GooglePlus.com. Uh, this way, your questions will show up right on our right in front of our faces, and we won't have any choice but to answer them. Um, so ask me anything. Um, you can ask about my work history, um, Tony's weight. Uh, it seems to come up. you probably don't need to ask about that. It comes up every episode. Yeah, it's better. Probably better if you don't ask. Better if you. I probably you whoever you are. I probably already told you <laughs> in an email That's or in true. person. That's true. I'm pretty. That's, it's probably your most frequent conversation. No, height so. is most frequent and weight is... Probably no, that you bring up, though. You bring yeah. it up to everybody. Yeah. You have to find a way to subtly jab yourself. Height uh, is most frequent and, and weight is as frequent. So. I had, speaking of, speaking of the things that people say to you today, I, so I, some of, some, some, I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I, I, do, um, I do some work uh, at a psychiatric inpatient hospital and two separate patients today in... At opposite ends of the day, they had no idea this happened. Both told me that I looked like Prince William. Wow. Yeah, I was pretty. I was happy with that. Now, <clears throat> one of them told me I looked like Prince Charles, Diana's son. So she said the wrong person, <laughs> but I know who she meant. And then the you other think, one. You think you know who she meant? <laughs> no, she definitely. That's because she said, "Yeah." She when I when I corrected her, she said, "Yeah, mm, yeah, that's right." And then the other one actually said I looked like she was thinking of Harry. So. I don't know if it was Prince William or not or whatever, but I'll, well, either way, I'm going to take it. Plus, he's he's slightly he's kind of going going bald, and I got a little bit of that going on. You can't really see it in the slight. I had like a breakdown yesterday. Um, saw a lot of thinning hair. So, anyway, sorry, man. Uh, yeah. Um, so please, uh, you know, send in your questions through the Google event. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, if you are on YouTube, that's fine. Um, but probably Google the Google event will be better and easier to to do that. Um, and we're hoping to get, um, well, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, so hopefully you'll have some questions um, at some point today. Uh, I know we have a couple of things that we want to talk about, um, just some uh, some news stories and stuff like that. We're going to try to get into one um, right away. I think that this is, trying to I don't know what the best one to, uh, to lead with would be, but I think that this is an interesting one to me. Um, Google... Now, a lot of people have opinions one way or the other on Google. Um, I believe that they're that they're Skynet, that they're going to take over everything, and that it's a bad thing. But mm -hmm. they do do they're they got a little Pablo Escobar situation going on where they do. I think they feel bad about the fact that they're they're eminent take over the world, so they try to do some nice things too. And they recently uh, on this article, I don't know if we do we have do we have the link to the article. On the uh, wire .com The article. Google article? Yep, we've got the yeah. Google article. Yeah. Uh, so they bought enough clean energy to power two San Francisco's is the headline. Um, basically what it means is they put... They uh, It was a great to see they, they used uh, gigawatts. They, are, they have accumulated two gigawatts of, uh, of reusable energy <clears throat> that they are continuing. Jigga uh, who? Clean. <laughs> gigawatts. Um, ah! <laughs> 
So I thought that was, you know, that's a good thing. I think that it's, it's nice to see um, a possibly evil corporation doing something to, to give back, and it's the, the type of thing that shows they're putting a lot of money into it, which is, you know, it's good. You know, give someone's putting some money into uh, something vaguely environment related. So I thought that was that was a good that was a, a nice uplifting thing for uh, for a kind of a rough couple of weeks. Um, I don't, so wait, so they bought some gigawatts. Yeah, they bought they bought a, a gigawatts worth of two gigawatts global, worth. Yeah, right. Of they brought their total capacity to two ga- it's gigawatts. Right, they right they increased their capacity for right. That's that's the. Um, and it's renewable energy. Yeah, right. the layman's term. So they're investing in yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean, they're always on the you know cutting edge and. Actually, a lot more people than ever care about the environment, believe it or not. The environment's in worse shape than ever, but more people care about it for that reason yeah. and becoming more conscious. I was just talking to my, my 401k guy at work. Who's you have a 401k guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a big deal. I'm, I got 30000 in there already. Not bad for a young guy who just started, like, very recently. Yeah, that's good. But anyway, 30000 American, U.S. dollars. <laughs> Uh, you know, from here, there's nowhere to go but up, really, uh, pretty much. But anyway, he was talking about how, like, a lot of really, you know, uh, bright people are not going to school to, like, get their MBAs or whatever. They're going for, like, you know, environmental stuff because that's where, um, that's where a lot of interest is and stuff like that. So, like, yeah. if you can come there's up with money. the next, yeah, if you can come up with the next, like, renewable energy or something like that, now Google will be interested in you. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like it kind of opens up completely different doors, and hopefully right. that's a sign of things to come. And hopefully, right. that, that, that could be part of the paradigm shift. Yeah, hopefully my 401k guy knows what he's talking about because it was actually kind of uh, he's trying to qualified to, to just make these statements. I, I think he is. He's one of my 30 man crushes. So You have so many. I do. It's really it's hard to keep track of. I actually keep it on paper and scribble it out all the time, and then I have to rewrite it. I rewrite it about once a week. Just trying to like organize my man crushes, keeping them all where they need to be, and it Make changes. Sure you, different things can happen. And then your wife finds it. That can be embarrassing. No, I tell her. I was open to her. I was open with her about my man crushes when we met. You know, that's good. She, she just more gets. She gets mad at me more about the turtles and the man crushes. <laughs> to be honest. Well, one is a lot smellier than the other. That's true. Well, depending on who they are. Right. The, the man, man crushes, crushes I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. Another article that I wanted to to talk about was this one is less related really to anything, but just kind of um, is very interesting. So they they found evidence. This is the uh, about the the ancient Egyptians. They found evidence. Uh, did I send you that link? You just gave me a look like I oh yeah I did. Um, yeah, the, the ancient Egyptians probably uh, bred raptors, so any kind of birds of prey. And then the reason that they know this, so that's a picture right there of a mummified. Uh, I think it's a kestrel. Does it say it right there? Yes, right down here. Kestrel, mummified kestrel. Um, M- mummified. fried. Mama fried. It looks fried. I would probably you put a little barbecue sauce and I would eat it. I um, would too. Yeah, that's that's a chicken finger. <laughs> um, we've all eaten stale chicken fingers. That's basically it amounts to the same thing. It's my favorite. Um, yeah. So they, they apparently they the reason that they they know that this was a captive uh, animal and bred specifically for the purpose of religious um, religious ceremonies was because that they found um, f- full rodents and other food sources in its stomach, so they had been force-fed uh, until probably the point of death and they were then mummified and offered up to the gods. Um, so kind of, I guess, kind of a what not to do with your pet. Wow, situation. But poor animal, you know, poor animal husbandry goes back. <laughs> yeah, I mean we all have to a force long feed. Way. We have to force feed on occasion, but until the point of death is a bit much. Well, um, how do they know that the bird wasn't like? How, how do you force feed a whole? I don't even want to think about it. It just sounds like sick, you know. Yeah, sci-fi, these are the things human, that I don't. I don't understand how they how they look at they look at the thing and then get all the information out of it. By saying, okay, well, they clearly were captive bred, and it, its <laughs> diet was, uh, he went on a small fly around the uh, around the temple at once every three days. Like, they, I don't know how they figure that stuff out, but that's what it says in the article. 
Well, I don't know why it's so definitive. Like I was reading, right. um, I was reading uh, when, when I went on to Arizona. I was reading um, one of Pritchard's books, and it's so good. But you know, with a lot of things, he talks about like how there might be like seven different uh, possibilities for why right. a species is dying or why it's thriving or right. whatever. And, and they're so definitive. And this thing was four thousand years ago. Right, and this is something that's happening like now, and you can't right. even, you, you know, know what I mean? And there's like right. different hypotheses yeah. all happening at the same time, and each one kind of, maybe one is more likely than the other, but how do you really know? So right. I think just sometimes when they report on this stuff, that's what it looks like, because a lot of times the titles are misleading and stuff like yeah. that. And That's true. Um, maybe one specialist just said that, and then, you know, they take it, because it's from a specialist, they take it as like that's what scientists found right, or whatever. I think that the, the interesting part of it, though, is that, I mean, we know, you know, I'm a history guy, too, and we know a lot about Egypt, ancient Egypt, but not that much, and it's just an interesting, I don't, I've never thought about what kind of animals and what the relationship with their environment really was, besides the fact, obviously, they had a lot of, uh, you know, their deities were all had the head of a jackal or some crazy stuff like that, not all of them. But you know they have they they worship the environment in a lot of ways. But this is just another um, you know outside of the the frame of religion. It shows that on a day to day basis that they had these this type of a relationship with you know native um, native species. It's just an interesting it's an interesting thing, and it's not that far away from you know some of the crazy stuff that we do now. Yeah, yeah. we don't force feed really for religious purposes, but I mean you know we do make them wear sweaters. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> like we do this, we do as much weird stuff. I think my dogs are both wearing uh, Christmas bandanas. <laughs> my cat has a hoodie on. That's why I, I don't know where she is. <laughs> um, cat gangster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She well, she's a Brooklyn cat. Um, uh, yeah, Brooklyn so. Nine Lives. <laughs> um, yeah. So actually, th those were just two of the things. We're gonna we may get to some more. Uh, there's a couple kind of, um, you know, similar articles. Um, please, if you have any questions about ancient Egyptian kestrels, um, don't direct those to me because I really just kind of skimmed that article. I um, can Google it for you. We, <laughs> yes, you can Google it, and Google will use one of its renewable energy servers across three continents um, to find that information for you. We're getting thirteen dollars to plug Google tonight. <laughs> I wish we were <laughs> right. That's the thing that they're that they have to. That's what I'm going to pitch to Google is the thing that I, you just mentioned. You mention it, and they just put it. It just goes in your bank. Yeah, well, I mean that's pretty much the next step at this point. I mean, we already get money from Google, right? Google owns YouTube. We get YouTube money. Yep, we get lots of money from Google. Making YouTube money. <clears throat> yeah. Huh? Google has helped uh, us make our jump to our new web host. You could say. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's what all the money from our YouTube channel goes to. Pretty Great. much goes right into the website, basically. Wait, we make money off our YouTube channel? Yes. Oh, yes, they're monetized. Oh, God, you guys should all watch all of our videos. Yeah, they're great. I have a video. Go by, like, video. by views. Oh uh, no, it's it's. There's like a formula. It depends. Like if they click into ads, you get more and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, the good thing about you, uh, YouTube ads is that they're all legit, and you should check them all out. Yeah, there's a lot of great ads on on YouTube videos, and you should click them What's, when you're on hold our on, videos. All right, hold on, we're gonna do something. Steve, I need you to pull up our YouTube page, pick up, pick any video. All right. Can we do uh, this? He's so yeah. mad. He doesn't want to do it at all. Here we go. Um, Jeez, it's been like six seconds. He doesn't even have it up yet. I was currently messing with the this live video on YouTube. All right, yeah. I've got one up. Okay. Uh, can we broadcast it? Yep. Give me a second here. Can we talk during it like uh, Mystery Science Theater? Sure. <laughs> well, what, what video did you pick? Hopefully, uh, with me. One of the newer ones, Planning Turtles. Okay. Oh, cool. That was uh, John. That was us at, at uh, Chris's place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what are we doing? I want to click on the ad. You can't click on the ad if he's broadcasting it. Why not? That's why I just want to say I'm, the point because is because he's showing us. Yeah, and that actually is. I don't want it for the money. I just want to prove that we have great ads. He can uh, click we don't on it. The ads. We're not allowed to. We can prevent certain things from being shown, but like I prevent anything from say Turtle Shack from showing up on our website or on nice. YouTube. Nice. Ooh. Stick it to the man. Those, okay. those dogs. Yeah, stuff like that. 
<laughs> so we can't click on the we can't go to the link that's that's at, that's an ad on our on our page. Occupational well, humor. You can, but it, it it's unethical. Uh, it won't reg right. It's unethical. And it won't register because it's our own channel anyway. Right. I'm not I'll trying to get our numbers up. I'm just trying to say as an example of the type of great ads that you guys can look at. Wait, whatever. This was a stupid bit. All right. We don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to keep doing it. Well, the other thing is Google and YouTube pull <laughs> ads based on somebody's browser history as well, so they're pulling ads that are relevant to whoever's watching. See, and that's the that's the Skynet stuff. That's the stuff that gets that gets scary to me. Yeah. Okay, so watch, you, right? So your ad probably is for what I can't see what it is, but it's got a, a, for hen feed or some weird. It's probably uh, actually, got. There's one right here for Hostgator, who's. Oh, uh, there it is. There it is. Camp okay. Cannon, you don't need any more love. They know us better than we know ourselves, Google. That's um, right. Okay. All right, so let's get let's get into one of the um, one of the meat and potatoes topics of our of our conversation. Um, so Tony, we we wanted to talk about which one did you want to talk about first? I know we have two things that you um, that you wanted to bring to the table. Do you want to talk about the uh, the program? Yeah, we'll talk about the new project first and and see if we have time. I for think that's the, yeah. for the other thing. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right. So whenever you want me to do, just tell me. Go ahead. Um. I think you can go ahead. Right now? We're good now? No. Wait. I'm ready. Wait. Espera in, in, in Spanish. <sighs> I think now you can go. Okay, now. Got it. Now. We're on? Are we rolling? Yeah, unless... Steve, do you have anything else you wanted to say about anything? Uh, we... Not right now. Okay, Tony. This yeah, feels can... unorganized. Tony, you can go. Got it. Okay. Trust me. We I, took it too far. I, know. I, know. I did take it too far? I'm yeah. two in a row. Okay, go. You took it too far. We took it too far, and then it made us sound unorganized. But we actually weren't unorganized. No, that was also a bit. Guys, listen, we're not unorganized. These are all these are all intentional bits. These are all hilarious they may, jokes. They may not be. They may not be good. They may not be good, but they're intentional. <laughs> you ate a candy. Yes. Go. Yes. Oh, I was man. going to. That's the, maybe I'll switch it to Purell because it's the only thing I have down here. <laughs> it's like take a swig of Purell. Okay, so anyway, uh, I wanted to talk about a really cool project that I have. So um, I don't work on a psychiatric hospital like John does, but um, I am a social worker. So I work with people um, basically who have obstacles in life. Um, usually, well, I don't have to get too far into it, but basically they have obstacles in life. So m my job is to serve them in a clinical fashion, work with them, try to help them get from point A to point B and to like uh, meet clinical. their goals. Yeah, it's clinical. Yeah. Okay. So you have like, you know, everything has to tie back into the treatment plan. You can't do anything with them that doesn't tie back in and, um, you know, be very trauma-informed and gender-responsive and all that good stuff. Okay. Anywho. Um, so I get to do a lot of creative things. But I've always been scared, like, to bring my hobby into it because even though it's like a, it could be a creative thing and it's like really positive. There's like, I don't know. I'm I'm the type of person that always likes to do what I like to do. I'm very selfish. Uh, my wife and John make fun of me for Gary. On they the call me Gary. Come, come. Gary from the movie The Breakup, where Vince Vaughn. Pretty much every one of Vince Vaughn's characters is like that, though. He's very selfish yeah. and like likes to do what he likes to do, stuff like that. So. Um, um, yeah, so I've always been kind of hesitant, but I had uh, a couple of people in my program who were really, really interested in doing something and kind of begged me to do something with turtles. So we have what's called the Second Chance Project, where people in recovery from uh, mental health struggles or substance use histories are able to um, learn captive husbandry and, um, like, you know, scientific uh, information about uh, Vietnamese pond turtles, Maremis anamensis, and are able to kind of master the captive husbandry and data logging and all of the stuff that um, the turtle room really cares about a lot. And then also the thing that the turtle room cares about the most, probably, education, they're actually able to go around, travel around and teach other people about their project what they're learning about the animals, what they know about the animals and the whole process and, and the whole nine yards. So it's like an amazing opportunity for them to build their resume 
and then have a chance to go out and, and talk about that at a job interview as opposed to saying, oh, yeah, you know, I've been out of work for five years. Oh, what right. have you been doing with your time? Oh, I've been looking for work. Like, no, you haven't. That's a crock. You could actually sit down and talk about uh, a, crock. a specific project. You know what I mean? Like, that's... Yeah. Was that like a reptile joke? Yeah. That definitely should be in your tagline for the... When you design, when you present this as a TED Talk. Not a Anthony crock. Curioni, this is a crock. This is not a crock. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a pretty cool project. <laughs> I mean, any questions from the peanut gallery, John? I have a few questions, yes. Yeah. So what is the age group? Well, that's what's really cool about it. Uh, so I do a lot with young adults. I run a young adult program uh, that I wrote the grant for. It's a pretty cool process, and we're just kind of starting out. Part of that is I get, I get, some, I get funding from several sources, and what one of those funders, probably my favorite people in the world, Street Smart Ventures, what they say is, there needs to be a young adult involved for it to be an official project that they'll fund. So there's always a young adult. I just so happen to have a young adult who's running it. Okay. Um, so in the early 20s. But then I have an adult uh, person um, who has a lot more life experience who is mentoring the young person. The young person has a little more um, knowledge about turtles now. But the, uh, the their elder is um, a, really helpful with just like life in general and you know just being responsible and stuff like that. So it's a really really awesome project. It's just it's so Gary on the kick drum. It's so funny that you. It's not Gary on the but, kick drum. No, but it's not in a negative way. It's very much your. It's honestly. So it is because this is a long-running joke between you and I that we, you know, I, I do all the things that you wanted to do for the last ten years. That's not true. Years. You're but, like that. No, but having said that, I know. But this is honestly, it really is an awesome. That is a great thing, and it's a good idea. And you've been doing so. You've been working for this program for you know a while, trying to find ways, uh, you know, to get basically stuff on people's resume to give them skills. And you found another. This is a very unique, um, unique set of skills, but it also is. Um, it leads to a larger, like there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that can be applicable from the stuff that you're like if you're logging data like that's cool like you know that's yeah. intense stuff that shows that you can be responsible that's really good. Yeah, right. And I, like I've made dog treats with them in the past. I've made a whole business business cards. Right. Uh, you know, working on you know stuff on Etsy, ice cream car all sorts of different things. It's like, what the hell do I know about ice cream besides just what it tastes like? Right. What do I know about dog treats besides... Uh, well, if, if anyone knows uh, knows a lot about ice cream. <laughs> I, I also eat dog treats um, because they're edible, and that's kind of uh, what goes into my uh, choices in fiber. Food. Yeah. <laughs> What's all this bad food for? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, Satan? Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's what's cool about it is that, and, and for any of us who are like reptile or more specifically turtle nerds, you know, like in your circle of like high school friends, family, coworkers, depending on what you do for a job, you are such a dweeb among dweebs, of, like mm -hmm. above dweebs, you are like so out there that the second you start to talk about something you're passionate about within that, so if you like Diamondback Terrapins and all of a sudden you start talking about Malachlemy is this and Malachlemy is that, like people are like, well, oh wow! First of all, you're ridiculously into this, and I just shut off. And whatever else you say, yeah. I'm just going to think is true. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing for them, because I know enough to make people just shut off and stop listening to me and assume that I know what I'm talking about. They can kind of do the same thing in an interview, which is really the best thing you could do when you're looking for a job. If you can convince the other person that you are smart and you have some good experience in general. Well, you then, want the other person to shut to shut off because you're talking. Yeah, you, no, you want no. What you want to shut off is their questioning of your. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Your uh, your your uh, mental abilities. Yeah, I mean, for yeah, there's there was. I guess I, I feel like, and you would know more because you hire people. But I, I I've I've done some limited idea of hiring. But like, the, I guess I'm guessing that the idea is kind of like, okay, once I know that this person has it. You either get it or you don't, and that's a good way to show. Yeah, I, I get it. I'm. I can do. You know, I can make this happen. It's a way to prove you get it without really getting it. Right. I was interviewing a woman last week, and I straight up judged a book by its cover. Yeah. And I was like, she's no, nah, she doesn't have it. No. 
<laughs> and I asked her a few questions because I'm a good person and I was going to go through the interview anyway. Yeah. And she was great. She was terrific. But like the, I don't like the way she walked in or the way she answered my first question, but just right. kept going with it. And then the way she answered question two through nine was amazing. And hmm. I'm like, you know, I was just telling my boss today who's going to do a second interview with her, like I really liked her and, and I think we should consider her. But it just, you know, if that's basically what an interview is about is I'm going to make you jump through hoops. It's like getting your under, undergraduate degree or any degree. I'm going to make you jump through these hoops and make you squirm a little bit to right, you have to prove that you can you can hold up to that and yeah and, and it's yeah. all a, it's all a joke. I mean, you hire people based on how they interview most of the time and that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to how they're going to be, you know. Right. A lot of good a lot of people are good interviewers and bad employees. There's a lot of people who are good at first dates and not at, you know, <laughs> right, right, intimacy, right. right. Yeah, yeah. You know what I yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. It, it is what it is. But I think, you know, being into something specific it can feel lonely sometimes. You know, especially if you live in the Northeast. Sorry, I say that like every podcast. But if yeah, you, you live in an area that's not much, what's that? Not as much lately. No, you lament it too much in general. I, 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 I do. Like to, I do. I wish you had a little civic pride. It sucks. <laughs> I love the Northeast, man. I love it too. Yeah. I'm I love to shut up. Here. <laughs> shut up. Jerks and your happiness. Go back shut to it. Oklahoma if you Nothing don't wrong it. with some snow, man. <laughs> oh, Elsa. Uh, yeah. I like a good snow day. Mm. Me too. Yeah. They don't have those down in Arizona. Do you want to build a snowman? They have windstorms. Yeah. Sand. I was cold when I was in Arizona, man. It's cold down there. Oh, you were in Arizona? What for? S- second time I mentioned it. I know. And I, I said Arizona for a reason, too. Well, I uh, All right, let's let's start stop pat, patting each other's backs for the segue, and let's start talking about your trip. That was a perfect segue. That was a good segue, that's except for when you said, "Hey, wait, that's the segue." God, wherever I go, Steve was the one that kept it going. Ball, right? Steve was a was a joker that kept it going. I was, just, gosh, don't blame him. Just talk. So I went to Arizona. Uh, it's a state in the U.S. It's uh. It's in the, the southwest, I think. I, I get a little foggy out there. It was the first time I ever went west, which was pretty cool. That is and, so uh, cool. So we also want to talk about some more news articles. Um, is that the whole story? Oh, you, were, <laughs> oh, you weren't done? Sorry. Ooh. My bad. Uh, yeah. So um, went down there for the Turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group's uh, fifth annual? Or no, it was sixth. It was their sixth annual conference, um, Mesa, Arizona. Gorgeous, lovely. Nice. It's very cold at night. All I brought was shorts. I brought. Oh, that's a rookie move. Yeah, I brought a backpack because I wanted to pack light and a computer bag. And then Delta Airlines guilted me into checking my carry-on bags, even though they were small. Uh, because I'm a good person, they kept asking. That's apparently what they do. They fill their flight, and then they don't have enough overhead bin space because everyone takes their rolly bags. And there's no yeah. space. Mm-hmm. Willie backpacks. Bunch of people smuggling animals, I think. I don't know. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so it was awesome. The conference was great. Russ Gurley and the TTPG guys do an amazing job. Um, I made a joke. Huh? Is that you what it is? A joke? Never. TTGP? TTPG. PG. Turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group. Oh, right, 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 okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I made a joke. I, I gave a talk while I was there, which was an awesome experience, but it's really weird. It was almost like giving a book report, but instead of you being in front of your class, you're in front of, like, 150 teachers who knew more about the subject than you. That's kind of intimidating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I probably knew more than a couple of people in the audience, but it was, it was cool. Um, the subject is something that I'm, like, really... Uh, passionate about, I spoke about the lack of males in the uh, Vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtle population in both the U.S. and in Europe, um, and it's something that I could research a lot for my book. Can you give and, us a, a, a rundown, a, a, a basic yeah, well, there's, to the talk? I don't have my notes, so I might forget something relevant, uh, important, but um, basically there aren't a lot of males for a few reasons. Number one, Males are usually under four inches, so if you look, yeah. no, nope. see you later. He's gone. Hello. Hey. This guy. This is an adult, a young adult male. 
And this is a very small turtle, right? Yeah. This is this is fully grown, and he's under it's four inches. The size inches. of a closed Nextel cell phone. Yeah. Well, actually, here's my cell phone. And this is a BlackBerry. Hmm. That's a small turtle, yeah. right? Uh, some of them say really small, but try emailing on that thing. Right. Right. And it's pointy too. So if you put it in your breast pocket, <laughs> you'd be in for trouble on your left nipple. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so so that was one reason they stay under. The males are under four inches. Our females are all, um, besides one, are over four inches. Um, so that's one part. The other part is that males were uh, kind of stressed more. They're more susceptible to um, death um, caused by like the stress and um, issues related to importation. Um, males are also produced less. Um, in captive breeding, uh, so that's an issue as well. And it's not proven yet if um, temperature dependent temperature determined sex temperature dependent sex determination is present. Wow, you in the species yet? Yeah, it took me three tries and two fumbles. But. The TDPD, I'm with you. TDPDDP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so um, it was a cool talk, and I think people really liked it. Um, Hans Dieter Philippen, which I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, from Germany. Actually, but I think that's right on the nose, man. I I think that's how I heard people pronounce it. But uh, he was so brilliant and so nice, and that's how like I felt with a lot of stuff. And anyway, when I went up and gave my speech, I my talk, I I commented about um, how so many man crushes were like actualized and brought to the next level at this, and after the talk. <laughs> After the talk, I was simple. All right, there was, all right, there was a, a, a the most helpful person I ever met in my life arranged for me to have a ride back to the airport because I needed a ride. So, she, just amazing. It was so nice. So then I'm standing outside waiting for this person so that we can go and get to the ride. And then a person who has turtles named after him, I'll just leave it at that, came up to me like scientific names. Um, came up to me and made a comment about how I was talking about man crushes and tractor beam sucked me right in. <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere else. I was like frozen, like, oh my gosh. And they were walking to like go and eat, like this group of people. And, and this group of people were like any single one of them, like I would have done anything to hang out with any one of them. And there was like 14 of them. And they were all going, and here's this guy who like I would have killed to meet. And he's like making jokes about my joke. And I'm loving it. Like, please make fun of me. Like, this is great. So he starts walking. I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk. I have all my bags to go to the airport. It is <laughs> hilarious. So I start walking. Next thing I know, cause my, my plan is when he's done talking to me, I'm going to turn back around and go get that ride that that nicest person I ever met had offered me to help me out with. Mm -hmm. But the conversation was so good. So good. What did you talk about? Well, like just turtle stuff. I don't want to I don't want to share everything. I don't have to get into it. The conversation was just really good, okay? okay. And it was yeah, it was about turtles. It wasn't just I wasn't just having I was fun. Say, that making, makes it sound probably a lot more alluring than it was. I don't need any more friends, John. I need more <laughs> turtle friends. There's a difference, okay? <laughs> so we're walking and it just never ends. And then the next thing I know, I'm at a Thai restaurant that's like 14 blocks away and I'm just there. I'm like, "Okay, you know what? I how about some Thai food?" So <laughs> I sit down and I basically just totally ditch the ride. So, I, like, I don't know what to do, and I'm sitting next to, like, you know, the, all these amazing people that I, like, I'm, like, you know, like, Chris Hagen's here, and Dennis Urig and Hans Dieter is here, and it's, like, the most amazing thing ever, plus a lot of other people that, I, I don't want to name everybody, but it was, it was awesome, and, um, yeah, so, anyway, like, I just made the biggest, like, jerk move in my life by, like, and then... I still got the ride to the airport. <laughs> you know, the person had to like stay up and be like, "Okay, what is this jerk doing?" and still and like had to pull strings to like get me a ride from a limo company to the airport. That happened. It straight up happened. All of it. Nice. So yeah, I owe someone pretty much my life, and then yeah, I don't know. and you said the heck with it. I want to talk about. Shell rot. No, we weren't talking about shell rot. We were talking about glorious things like rare Asian species. Mm. 
Okay. The reason I get out of bed in the morning. All, all in all, all in all, a good, um, you know, it's good. It's nice for the turtle room. Is an important thing. Again, while, while I just speaking of the turtle room, I just want to say, if you have any questions, please, please put them forward on the Google event, um, so we can see them directly. Where, um, from from now on, if you're ever watching a podcast, um, please. Do that, or uh, or you can also, if it's after the fact, you can email, and we can try to get you in the next episode. But yeah, that's a good, you know, it's a good thing for the turtle room. We've been we've been repping pretty hard in a lot of uh, you know, a lot of events and and so on lately, and I think that that's that's always a that's a good thing. Um, so nice job, Tone. Thanks, man. Um, you're welcome. You're very welcome. We also went to a zoo while we were out there. Oh, okay. Which zoo? I hung out with some friends from from uh, Europe and some friends from the U.S. and it was awesome. We went. It's called a uh, World Wildlife Zoo. It's a ZAA zoo. It's not an AZA zoo, but uh, it was good. It was good. Um, I was with Fairy Grunwald, who is Grunwald. Come on, it's got an umlaut, man. Grunwald, and he also <laughs> doesn't. He also doesn't pronounce it uh, fairy. He pronounces it Fetty. And uh, he was a, a treat. What a hoot. And I spent like a day and a half with him straight, and it was amazing. I'm so grateful that I went on the year that he was going to be there because these guys from Europe aren't going to go every year. Right. You know, He's from the Netherlands, and he's uh, super knowledgeable. He did two talks. And then also uh, with Markus Euer from Germany who did... Uh, two talks on both on GMIDA, one on Spangler and one on Japonica. I'm so definitely, we should definitely start a, uh, a podcast of just you pronouncing European names. I'm, I try my best. <laughs> I have just just read through the the telephone book in Prague. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But uh, he he uh, he's the editor of Radiata Magazine, which is like a great publication in the turtle world. That comes out in German and English, and it can be kind of tough to get. So, I don't know, that was a treat, just being able to hang out with them. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, there. Do we have, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I haven't seen any, do we have any questions yet at this point, Steve, or anything? Sadly, no. Nothing, nothing yet. Um, nothing you, yeah. nothing you can make up on your own. Can we each no, think of a question that. that someone might yeah, ask? And we no, not. we have questions. Steve, Michaela sent us questions. Yeah, that's what oh, said. you have those in your email. She didn't send them to me. I forwarded them to you. No, you didn't. Oh, you sack of potatoes. All right. Well, the, can we? The last email I have from you is. This is what makes us look unorganized. Not my bits, by the way. No, oh, no, your bits do it too. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't heard anything from you by email since yesterday I, at 2 p.m. when you told her to send you her questions. All right, I'm going to ask you a question that she has because you're the most qualified to answer it, but we need to go over some ground rules first. Okay. Ooh. All right. Ground rule number one. I like this. Okay. Yeah. Rule number one. Take it easy. Now, this is something that you can take and run with. We know what you've done with your amazing work on turtle diets and all that type of stuff, so just take it easy. It is Number seven, two, four, make sure four, you four, make sure yeah. you stop to take a breath and or to let John and I make fun of you uh, periodically throughout your answer. Does that make sense? I got candy ready. <laughs> Good. Well, just start eating it throughout. <laughs> so the question yeah. is, this is a pretty simple one, but the question is, um, what is your opinion on UVB lighting versus supplementation? Um... <clears throat> Ready, go. And we lost them. <laughs> because UVB lighting is um, part of the natural environment for many species, I'm a big fan of including it in spite of the fact that diet can replace the vitamin D that they might generate from the UVB. Um, I'm all about natural habitats. Therefore, a turtle that lives in a heavily for forested area that may not see many UVB rays because... A uh, small fact about UVB is it doesn't really even it doesn't even penetrate glass. So um, we're talking about a clear thing; it doesn't even go through that. 
So UVB doesn't really penetrate like tropical forests very well, you know, especially really dense ones. So an animal that lives in the tropical forest floor may not actually get much UVB. So with a species like that, it's um, probably less important to include UVB as part of the natural habitat. That said, a sun-loving, basking animal is going to spend plenty of time out in the open uh, with UVB. So providing UVB in whether it's you know, because their habitat is outside or as with artificial lighting inside is part of replicating a natural environment. <clears throat> so despite whether we can replace the, you know, the vitamins in supplement or not, I, I've always been a big proponent of make things as natural as possible so the turtles are as happy as possible. And you get rewarded for that as a keeper. Uh, happier turtles are going to produce more babies. Drop the mic. Nice. That was uh, just under a minute. I'm, I'm, I have, I always had a clip and, and ready to go, and I can't play it now because you did good. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Isn't that good? I have one more question. If, if you want me to go with it. Yeah. 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 I have the permission. So, the next question is, how much benefit does stopping the importation of a species have to that species? if it also limits the number of people who actually be able to work with them in captivity. Is this for us in general or are you trying to Yeah, I think you and I think you and I could probably both speak to that. Okay. Um I'm going to let you guys take this one. Yeah, no, you could you could I mean this is this is kind of common, you know, this is this is something that anyone could have an opinion on. Go ahead. Like, like the one that comes to mind for me with this one is um, the Federal Endangered Species Act here in the United States of America, which uh, basically limits interstate commerce or distribution of animals listed. And the good news is, and I, I'll always fight this one, so there's, there's arguments all the time, like they were going to list the spider tortoise recently. And then the argument was, well, you're not going to be able to breed them, and you know it's going to make a, a huge issue. And um, I think as far as what Michaela's here with keeping them, um, it doesn't put a damper on it that much because CBWs are are very frequently issued for non-native species like spider tortoises that are from Madagascar when they're being bred in captivity by CBW holders. So that's very easy. The issue is, for me as a keeper, that kind of stinks. I mean, you got to do what you got to do if you're fish and wildlife. But for ring map turtles or bog turtles or whatever other natives are listed on that, they do not give CBW permits for the natives. So the only way that they can change hands is just being straight gifted from one person to another. And that means no, you know, uh, no paying for shipping even. Uh, so it does it does limit a lot what you can do. So Yeah, and you know, I think it's a very fine line. Um, there are, you know, plenty of species which aren't too terribly threatened at this time. So um, you know, in some ways <clears throat> getting some animals into conservation hands now uh, might be beneficial, but at the same point, you don't want to pull too many animals from the wild, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and I guess, you know, this kind of speaks to, you know, one of our core beliefs here at the Turtle Room is we believe that in-situ and ex-situ conservation efforts have to work together. doesn't matter what we do in captivity if their habitat and the wild population isn't saved. And... If the ha you know um, some species are down enough in the wild that if we save the habitat but don't work on propagating the species to try to eventually repopulate the area, then again, you know the full potential isn't being realized. But at the same time, we don't want to be uh, pulling animals out of the the wild just to fulfill the hobby. Because there's no right. there's no way to guarantee those animals to get imported or going into conservation. Yeah. In fact, most probably aren't. 
That's, um, the, that's the big point that we hadn't touched on yet, Steve, absolutely. Right. That they're coming in in the pet trade, and they're here for the amusement of people, just like my, you know, Karen Terriers are. It's the same thing, you know, the dogs are bred and created for human amusement. That's why they're here. That's what they're doing. And when they get hit for a car, right. by a car their whole sad existence was just to, to amuse me. And um, it's on, on, for, on some level, anyway. And that's my opinion. Um, I'm actually a pretty optimistic person, and that's a pretty pessimistic view, but it's just, we get like that about animals sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the truth, too, is if you look at like I don't know, Russian tortoises, if they're, they're not bred very much, so if they stop importation now, and they, it turns out some research was done and they ended up being way more rare than we thought they were because of all the importation that's happened recently, then, uh, you know, there'll be people probably five years from now that said, man, I wish we could still import some of those so we can get them into good hands for conservation. Like, well... Right. Well, uh, and, and, you know, go ahead. The questions are a funny one to bring up because as relatively prolific as they appear to be in the wild, producing enough to sustain this kind of, seemingly producing enough to sustain this kind of importation, replicating the correct conditions for them to reproduce in captivity seems to be difficult because there are not not many breeders successfully having Russian tortoise offspring yearly, which is one reason why wild-caught imports are still cheaper than the um, offspring. Mm -hmm. Um, you're, uh, you're, you know, captive bred Russian tortoise baby. You're talking 175 to 200. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, for a tortoise that you think of as really common. Right. You know, meanwhile, the Greek runs what 75. Yeah. Well, like that. well, that would be a really good price. I think Greek's probably more like 100 plus. Is it 100? But okay. I think Chris's price of 80 that he usually has a Hamburg is like a dynamite price, especially because he knows the locality of all of his. So uh, that's that's a big one. But uh, I have another question from a viewer. All right. Hit so uh, is is that all right, John? Hit it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just over there yawning. I thought you were going to say something, but you. Were I had like three times when I was about to say something, and then I tried. I tried not to actually, but if it's not. I'm I'm with, I'm, I'm dialed in. Don't worry about me. Well, I'm wondering what type of psychotropic medication you might be on right now. Just judging from the look of you on your face. I don't get it. You look a little under the weather. <laughs> I had a little long yeah. weekend. In a substance abuse kind of way. Okay. Anyway, so we have another question. So Mike Robs writes in and asks, what is the best food to feed to a Chinese box turtle? Mm. Which is... A little uncomfortable because I think I'm going to answer that question. Well, you're the probably the best qualified to, right now of us three since you actually are working with these. Yeah. Um, so uh, Chinese box turtles, uh, Cora flava marginata, or as they're referred to uh, in the trade uh, by hobbyists, uh, flavos, or flavos for short, um, they are a really, really awesome species. They have gone up a lot in price, I think, over the past few years. And um, they're really cool because you get everything like everything you want in a turtle. They're really personable. They're really hardy. They're very um, versatile as far as what like habitat they can be in. But you can start them off aquatically or terrestrially. Um, they grow to a manageable size, but they're kind of a bulky animal at the same time. Even though they're an Asian species, they can hibernate in some of the colder uh, North American winters, um, so really, really cool species. Anyway, as far as diet, they're like rock solid, so you can feed them the live stuff like earthworms, crickets, uh, mealworms if you uh, wanted to risk impaction, but my point is, that I'm trying to get at, is that you don't have to risk it because they're so dynamite, they're so hungry, they're a lot like me, and you can kind of play it smart and play it safe and choose food items that um, that you want them to eat. So you can supplement with an earthworm here or there because earthworms are, you know, they are good, but um, instead of 
instead of spending the more money or finding them and risking like the parasites and stuff like that. You can just feed them fruit and pellets and vegetables, and they'll eat it all and come back the next day wanting more. They're they're very easy to feed. So I think variety is key. Um, for fruits, I feed mine uh, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, mango, blueberries, banana, um, all sorts of different fruits. For veggies, I usually sneak in some squash. Um, and then for pellets, I, I, I mix that as well. Carrots as well. They'll eat, um, they'll eat, they'll eat pretty much anything. But uh, also, um, for as far as you know, mix of pellets, I'll use Missouri is my favorite. But I'll mix in different pellets. I'll put in um, some some krill, uh, some freeze dried shrimp, stuff like that. To kind of mix it in. But uh, whatever I have on hand to uh, use Zoomed growth for the smaller ones. So really, you can get creative. The key again is variety. Don't be afraid to get a couple different pellets. Don't be afraid to use different fruit. If they favor only one fruit, keep trying the new fruit that you want to introduce and s until they so try that. One. It's usually it's pretty, pretty easy. If they're not eating, it's probably because it's cold or they're sick. So, um, not because they don't like the food, because they will pretty much eat anything. Nice. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Little tanks. Don't keep them in little tanks. He's saying that they are little tanks, like right. army tanks. They are little tanks. That's right. They're they're durable. They're yeah. They're <laughs> you tough. can just keep them in little tanks, <laughs> like a beta, like no. a beta fish. No. <laughs> Steve's always giving out bad husbandry advice. That's the thing. <laughs> you know. My cat just jumped on the bed and and dragged her butt across my bed. Oh, I hate when they do that. Yeah. John, you were on drugs right now. Have you been sleeping? I wasn't listening really to that. The answer to that question because I was watching the cat do this, thinking, man, she may have worms. John can't wait to get off this podcast so can go <laughs> true. and watch silly cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> that is not true. John, we are the six foot nine cat lady. Um, yeah, I love my cat. I for, I just like to be clear. There was there's been no substance abuse in any way. For for I just want everyone to know that. Okay. For all those straight edgers out there, don't worry. It's all prescribed medication. You can show this to your kids. Okay. We're not um we're not getting crazy. Um. So bad. We are gonna be wrapping up. We have a couple of things just we wanted to finish with. Um, we want to plug. Please check out our our website. Uh, we have a lot of apparel. We actually are coming off a, a pretty uh, a pretty successful weekend at Hamburg. Uh, we got we saw a lot of you guys there. Uh, thanks uh, Pennsylvania. For, for Pennsylvania. coming out. Not, not Germany. Not the home of Deerdorf Musselberg, Tony's friend from Arizona. Um, <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> Just respect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no. So check it out. We have a lot. I mean, we have calendars. We can make a. They're, they're bigger this year, I believe. Right? Is that? There we go. We got. It. Okay. No, they're they're same size as last year. Oh, they're they're same size. Seven. Okay. Uh, but we yeah, did uh, individually shrink them this year. I'm mm -hmm. uh, getting a little bit of glare, Steve. A little bit of glare. Yeah, I see it coming off of your glasses, man. Oh, Damn. Nerd alert. Um, Four eyes. So check out yeah, check out our our calendars, and we have some new apparel in there too. We have a lot of good stuff. Um, um, the, yeah, the, shirts, we're down to just uh, extra large and 2XL because oh. uh, all the rest of them are gone now after Hamburg. So, If any of you are as enthusiastic about chicken parm as Tony is, then log in and check out our t-shirt sales because we, we got two something XLs. for you. We got <laughs> something for you. Right. Um, um, do oh, you have any men sizes or are they all 2XL smaller? Three dollars and fifty cents from every calendar sale goes to the Turtle Survival Alliance's Survival Center as a part of our partnership with them. TSA. Check a couple of the photos in there. Them. A couple of the photos in the in the calendar are also from the TSA. Yes, there are. There's two months that have fo photos from the TSA, and there's a couple small ones thrown in there too uh, on the inside cover and stuff. Bonus. Nice. Um, and do we want to talk about the um, contest? Yes. Oh, oh! I got a, I got a, I got a, a facial spasm from Steve. I think I feel like we got it. We have to go over things much more clearly. 
Steve um, might Steve, be Steve reacts one hundred percent of the time. I'm look like I don't know if he's just anxious or what. I'm just like, oh god, I said something I shouldn't. I thought he was having a stroke because it was just one. <laughs> I, I'm just being goofy. That's all. Steve is gonna talk like this soon. Um, so <laughs> that's not funny. That's not. Funny. <laughs> that's not funny. No, I know it's I'm not. Sorry. Um, please, please check out. Um, it's gonna be in in the coming months. We're gonna have a little more information coming up soon, but um, we have. Uh, a little bit of a contest with um, uh, with some of our tone. They're not gonna, they can't see that because you're not talking. They can see it small. Okay. Um, I can you want to ex- there you okay, go. There you go. Present it. Perfect. Um, yeah. So we're going to be uh, through a, a, one of our affiliates and a couple of our affiliated websites. We are going to be um, giving away a couple of highly sought after. Uh, animals that um, are the cornerstone of any collection I would say they're 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 nice they're they're not the cornerstone of any collection no, no they're those are they're, they're pretty cool stuff <clears throat> kill it we're gonna do you want me to, do you want me to explain sure I said you should explain and then you were just waving your your damn turtle around in front of the camera I never heard that we're gonna have to rewind it and and agree to disagree because I never okay, heard explain that. because I clearly don't know what it is so, <laughs> <laughs> so you go let's put it this way we're still working out the details we're gonna share with you what we know now right. when we talk about me hiring and firing I thought I people, said that pretty clearly we don't know everything we we mentioned earlier about me hiring and firing people and I'll tell you that from an HR standpoint, it is very important to not to accuse anyone of anything. So when I talk about John's performance, I'm going to say that he appeared to be under the influence, not that he was, because I don't know. I'm not there to give him a urinalysis test. I can't. Do you know what I mean? So I'm just going to say you appeared to be a little off your game. That's all. Under the weather. I'm but uh, anyway, yeah. This is my so fifth back, job. Back to the contest. If you don't mind. The turtle room. Some of the turtle room breeders breed morphs. Uh, morphs are very, very popular. They're kind of, we like to think of them as a gateway drug. That's a term that John knows about. Uh, <laughs> into, into turtle keeping and reptile keeping in general because uh, sometimes when you know you grow up loving turtles or, or, or reptiles your whole life and then you see this morph, you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I've never seen anything like that. And it gets a lot of excitement for somebody who's kind of like, you know, uh, just started in their research and stuff like that. So there's no denying how popular morphs are. So um, some of the most popular morphs that you'll find uh, are albino common snapping turtles and albino sulcata tortoises, really, really popular. So we personally, Steve and I, don't think they're cornerstones of a of a any collection because we were not a great way to sell the contest though that's the point that's why I said that I was trying what I just want to say I'm not trying to sell the people will want them they speak for themselves so what we're basically doing is there's some kind of stipulation that we're not really totally sure about yet if Jared was here (laughs) he'd be able to to pin it down for us but the animals speak for themselves you got an albino common snapping turtle worth about $7,500. I don't know how the Asian market has been um, affected lately. And then you have an albino sulcata tortoise, which is worth about $2,500. We're putting both those animals up. Um, this will involve you liking the turtle room on Facebook and uh, most, most definitely some other turtle-related sites uh, or pages. Um, and... Probably some other stipulation in there as well related to sharing uh, the post or something like that. Uh, something that could maybe be monitored daily. We're not really sure yet. Um, we're, we on the podcast are not really sure yet. We wanted to get Jared on the horn beforehand, but then neglected to do so, or um, we're not successful in doing so. So, so basically, we're gonna we're gonna give you the full information next next month. Yeah. Monday, January fourth is our tentative date. We should be the next time that we're uh, that we're that we're up live. And we're going to give you the full, the full rundown of that uh, of the contest at that time. But we wanted to just plug it and get your, you know, get the juices flowing. Yeah. One other thing, generally, uh, the contest is a reptile report uh, kind of uh, invention to go along with an upcoming snake bites episode where they're going to be at uh, Garden State Tortoise, a fill, you know, which is Chris and Garden State Tortoise are very close partners with us. At, um, we do a lot of things together. Chris is one of our staff members as well. So they're going to be filming there. Um, they're going to be doing some things 
to go along with the 2015 um, awards that the Reptile Report does, and this contest is kind of going to go along with that. And so this is all kind of a, a Reptile Report and Snake Bites TV big thing, and we're just kind of, uh, in some ways we're tagging along for the ride since Jared has these crazy animals that he wants to give away to benefit the turtle room. So, and, and Andrew. And Andrew. And Andrew. Right, yeah. and Andrew. Yeah, just it's those guys are so they're wonderful people and they're um, they've helped us so much and I mean this is just like a microcosm of the generosity that they um, show on a regular basis really that a lot of people don't always get to see so we're really excited about um, hopefully the notoriety that'll come from this and then again this is another way that the turtle room because people always ask when we have pictures of albinos and stuff on our website well, what's the point if you guys are supposed to be on con conservation what does this have to do well we're about education and recessive genetic mutations are not a horrible thing to educate someone about hey that's a small piece the bigger piece is we use the albinos a lot if we're making any money off of them things like that they do go into funding a lot of um, other projects and then something like this the notoriety hopefully that will come with it will will hopefully lead to some education for some people who might be brought in uh, by this uh, gateway uh, these gateway turtles that's what we should call those gateway nice. turtles gateway yeah, turtles the gateway turtles yeah that's a that's a there's the title yeah. of the contest right there oh man trademark I'm totally yeah gateway turtle contest wow so All right, guys the next show is on January 4th most uh, likely January fourth, yes. January fourth, we could we could stick to that, and then I, I, I also want to game. check out YouTube. Check out YouTube tomorrow yeah. when uh, footage from my visit to uh, Ralph Till, uh, Ralph Till's place in Florida um, is uh, released. Really cool, um, really dedicated keeper who does everything the right way and um, with small species and on a pretty small scale. So I think like uh, most people can benefit from seeing how he does things. As opposed to seeing these videos of these big time keepers who have, you know, a whole, who have a thousand animals. You can see how this guy keeps 40 or 50 animals in like perfect conditions. So, okay, so check out the, uh, check out the YouTube page. Click the link, don't click the link, whatever you want to do. Um, we love you guys and we will talk to you one month from now. Deuces. <laughs>